Welcome to The Well Drop, Own Your Wellness. I'm your host, Amber Berger. And I'm Dina Wismer. We are mothers, friends, wellness experts, and self-described warriors who have each experienced our own unique personal wellness journeys. We are here to help you learn how to own your wellness. So Dina and I, we wanted to talk about who we are and how we even got here today. We are mothers who met through mutual friends. I think it's all about, you know, your community and that it takes a village to really raise your kids. And Dina is a huge part of that for me. Our sons met before they went to school in pre-K. And Amber, I'm going to cry thinking how old they are now, (laughs) but okay. (laughs) They're going into middle school now. And we'll just say we call them Bash Brothers. They really just kind of had such a wonderful, beautiful bond from the beginning, right, Dina? Uh, yeah, they were they were brothers from another mother from the time <laughs> they met, yes. <laughs> and soon Dina and I realized that we also had a mutual love and that was for wellness. We became each other's trusted advisors regarding who are the different wellness experts that we use as our advisors. And we started to compare notes and then even share and kind of give each other, you know, referrals of, you know, if it was our facialist to a functional medicine doctor to a craniosacral therapist for colonics. What else? (laughs) The list list. list goes on and on. Chiropractor. And I think we both, you know, came to wellness from two different perspectives. And I think we want to show that there isn't really one path or one way to engage in wellness. And that really it's all about just starting somewhere and not throwing your hands up saying, oh, there's just so much out there. It's just not even worth starting. That if you do the work, that the results in time pay off and that it's really a marathon, not a sprint. And I think, you know, American culture, we're all about quick fixes. You know, what is like the best diet, this and that. And we've really lost touch with our bodies and connecting to our bodies. And I think, you know, Dina and I are sort of in this new phase. We're in our 40s and becoming obsessed with perimenopause, which you can't wait to talk about on this podcast in depth. And really, I think it's important about reconnecting to your body and trusting your intuition and not just outsourcing everything. I think you can outsource in the sense of getting advice from a lot of different people and experts in their fields, but at the end of the day, gathering that advice and making your own decisions within your own body, yourself, and for your family. We've been fortunate in that we've been able to meet with a lot of experts. And part of what we wanted to do with this podcast is to help as much of that information be as readily available to as many people as possible. Wellness should be accessible for everybody. People should not have to wait until their situations become acute to understand how to care for themselves. And I think we both share a passion in helping to spread information about empowering your own health and your own health decisions before you become sick so that it doesn't get to that point in manageable ways for all kinds of families. Yes, I totally agree with that. I think that is such an important point is, you know, managing your wellness and doing little steps every day to help yourself regarding even if it's like a morning ritual, you know, certain vitamins or fasting, whatever it is that's your starting point that you feel connected to, just start somewhere and in time keep adding to that routine and that that will lead to great results. Speaking of starting, your story started with your birth from the very beginning. <laughs> yes, I don't think I've realized until, you know, recently, you know, looking back, I think a big difference of us like why I listen to Amber and Dina, who are we? I think, you know, the biggest part is that we are mothers and we've lived through experience and I think, you know, without even having necessarily an MD credential, like I may be you know, a health coach certified and I'm a breathwork master. To me, you know, having some label to your name really doesn't matter. I think experience comes as number one and we've both lived it. And, you know, my story is sort of long-winded in the wellness department. I basically was born with intestinal atresia and my mother will be on another episode so you'll hear the story in depth, but basically I almost died at one day old. And they discovered my intestines collapsed and I had surgery. I never really thought of it until recently. My mom explained to me that actually my stomach always sort of bothered me, but I don't really remember that. But eventually when I turned 11, I was diagnosed with JRA, which is juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And at the time, the protocol was for 
aspirin. And so I was put on high doses of coded aspirin, which I believe then sort of ate into my intestines. And I was then diagnosed with Crohn's disease at 14 years old. And it took them a while, I would say months until they could figure out what was wrong with me. It was to the point I couldn't eat any food. I was just eating baby food. I had surgery. This is going back into 1995. And Amber, your mother, though, always had a very strong intuition about how to care for you, right? Am I, I don't want to jump ahead. Yes, no. Episode, so my but... mom at the time was endless researching and advocating. But I think my mom felt really betrayed by the medical community. You know, she was promised that being on that aspirin for me would not affect my stomach and it would be fine. It was coded. So I thought- The medical community loves a one pill fix. Yes. Uh, no, no offense to doctors and everybody who donates their wonderful time. We certainly believe that everything we're going to be talking about supports that, but- For acute- purposes, yes. I think, yes. not for a long term. And I was probably yes. on it at least one to two years, in addition to having cortisone shots in my knee, my right knee. So then when I was diagnosed with the Crohn's and she was saying, is there a connection, right? You're trying to connect the dots. And I think a lot of what we'll talk about on this podcast is really being your own detective and connecting those dots. There's so many signals and so many messages. And the doctors all just, they're, you know, it's not even their fault. And I think this is like a big point of to utilize doctors or experts at what they study in and what they do, but they're not also experts in nutrition. And they're not experts at trying to connect one body part to another because they're really so focused on certain areas and there's not really that much crossover. So it's really, it's more the academic, you know, there's, there could, there could be some things that are done to help, but that's where the advocating comes from us. So we, as a person, you yourself need to do the research because you can't just rely on one person. They're not an expert in all fields. And I think that is a misnomer. Anyways, fast forward, had Crohn's, had surgery. What was the protocol after that? To go on prednisone, a steroid, indefinitely. That was the lifelong protocol. So after the whole Bayer aspirin fiasco, my mom and I were not feeling comfortable with that. And luckily, my aunt had a client out in L.A. that had just come back from a place called the Macrobiotic Institute and said, you know, this really helped her son. Why don't you go? And before I went to a summer program, we said, OK, let's go. I vividly remember eating at IHOP and having chocolate chip pancakes and not knowing what the next step was going to be. But we really went in with an open mind and an open heart and my entire life transformed in one week. I was on prednisone post-surgery and after being at the Institute for three days, I went off my medicine and never looked back. And I was at the time, I think, turning 15. I am 42, turning 43 now. I've knock on wood, never been on medicine since. And I just had a colonoscopy not that long ago, and I'm Crohn's free. And I say that I heal myself from Crohn's through the power of food. And I learned at a really young age about food the power of energy, the soil components, and macrobiotics really kind of blew up afterwards from Madonna and Gwyneth Paltrow. You know, it's a very hard diet to stick to, but in terms of a healing diet and the people that I met there that it helped them with cancers, this and that, I think it just cools the body off from inflammation. And it definitely did that for me. Now, you know, I eat a re like a regular diet. It taught me about being able to go back and having some healing foods and healing practices and a lot about self-care practices at the time it taught me about traditional asian culture which was you know shiatsu reiki acupuncture so many different modalities which i then leaned on in my 20s you know when i was working and had stress and didn't know what to do and that's like when i would have so-called a flare up or my stomach would bother me a little bit and i always like lean back into that in order to like bring me back to balance how were your pregnancies were they, did they, how did they affect your health? So interesting. So a lot of times they say if you have an autoimmune disease when you're pregnant, your autoimmune disease won't bother you. But I was pregnant with my first child at 31 years old um, or 30. I was pregnant at 30 and I had him at 31. So I was a little nervous and I think our parents were nervous not knowing what does that mean? She has Crohn's, even though I technically felt fine. I was completely fine. Really, I was totally fine throughout my pregnancy. Once I became a mother, my wellness kicked into a higher gear. When I first had my son, I really focused on the quality of his food. I changed all of our food to make sure that it was organic, number one. And if everything couldn't be organic, I really learned from the environmental working group what the dirty dozen was and what the clean 15 is. And if you don't know what that is, we will be getting to that in detail. 
and also regarding a delayed vaccine schedule. But it wasn't until actually I had my second child at about 34 that I didn't necessarily recover the same. And I sort of had to lean back into my old roots and figure out, you know, what I needed. And it started with doing a lot of different lab work, testing my hormones, checking for heavy metals in my body, and really build myself back up with the help of a nutritionist and functional medicine doctors. So when I was in my 20s, I luckily was introduced to Dr. Frank Littman, who really helped me survive the stress of everyday work in my 20s and into my early 30s and helped me get my pregnant. He helped to sync my cycle what used to be 40 days, he got it down to 28 days through acupuncture and supplements. And that really inspired me to stay on top of my body and always check my lab work every six months. After I had my daughter, I sort of fell apart again and I had to lean back into what Dr. Littman taught me and start testing my body again twice a year and build myself back up. And it was through that that I started to really start to make small changes in my everyday to make sure I took care of myself first before I was able to even take care of my family. And it was through simple practices such as breath work, even making myself a coffee in the morning. I think that's a huge ritual of starting your day off with the intention of helping yourself first before your family. We're such moms and we're such givers and all we do is give, 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 but sometimes we forget and always put ourselves, they say, last on the to-do list. And it's really so true. Yep. And I think it's- I struggled with that for years too. Uh, but you challenge. are the core and the center of your family. And if you are not well, then the rest of the family can't thrive either. Yeah. yeah. And I think it was fine with one child. I was able to get by, but once I had two, I just, I think I ran myself into a wall and I really had to- realize I got to put myself first in order to keep going. And it was through that experience that it led me to discovering I love helping people. I think that's at the core of who I am. Every job I've had, it's always been about helping others. And again, trying to help my husband was sick one time. I discovered salt therapy, opened up a wellness studio. I was so inspired by it and wanted to share it with more people. Interestingly enough, life always throws curveballs. Once you feel like you're in your groove, I'm feeling good. My body felt strong again. I was mentally feeling amazing also. It wasn't until my son actually had strep throat two to three times in a row that I did give him a course of antibiotics because I was scared. I know that sometimes strep throat can lead to pandas. How old was he then? Eight in a couple months. This was second grade. This was a second grade, exactly. I, yeah, I remember this very, very well. And he yeah. didn't feel great. His stomach was hurting him and he never had digestive issues before. And after the second round of antibiotics, I always followed it with probiotics. I've been giving my kids probiotics since they were born. I knew something was wrong. So I said, there has to be something else. We need to do some more testing. And again, just trusting, you know, a mother's intuition. And just to note, this was right before COVID started. Yes, too. it was a crazy, it's, yeah. in hindsight, it was, it was a crazy an, time. An yeah. insane time. This was Thanksgiving of 2019. And he was diagnosed December of 2019 with Crohn's disease, which for me, I mean, was gut wrenching. I mean, I was trying so hard to have him not get Crohn's. I didn't want him to go through what I went through, even though I came out on the other side. It's interesting, even with the same diagnosis, same family, you both have two different journeys. We went on a 12 week liquid diet for my son who was eight and a half years old. Which, I, I remember this well. <laughs> I rem yeah, which because, is yeah. Wild. And thank God for Dina and her son and all of their friends were so supportive of my son who was coming to school with these drinks and he wasn't eating. And I mean, he's eight and a half years old. It's pretty wild. The mental fortitude that he had and he, really the trust even having in me of saying, let's try this because the protocol was to be on steroids which we did do for six weeks to just get him out of this hyper painful state. And so I said, let's try this natural, more natural method. And it actually didn't work for him. And it did help all of his labs, interestingly enough. But I have to also give Brandon a lot of credit. He is such an amazing kid, always has been, but this is a huge example of his 
maturity and his understanding and okay let you know he i just remember there was no complaining he did what he had to do and he's really exceptional in that way um for my kids i would have had a lot of complaining <laughs> yeah <laughs> i sure. mean it, it's pretty mind-blowing to us and my husband and i even today that he just was on board from the start and said okay and i guess it's the power of even a, a young age versus an adult like it's mind over matter he just is like all right i'm gonna do it and he is a huge foodie. I don't know if you met a child that's more foodie than my son. And he actually had no problem because he was satiated. You're not hungry. And it was actually tasty. Unfortunately, he was in enough discomfort that he knew he I'll had try. to do something. I mean, he it wasn't like he could function the way that he was. I think that also contributed to his willingness to do what it took to be able to live a normal life again. Mm -hmm. It was interesting to see that actually all his lab work normalized. But then we did a pill camera test. You know, he started February and by June we did another test. Now we're in COVID. OK, <laughs> I mean, it was wild. I mean, it was almost like easier that he was on a liquid diet in COVID. We didn't have to worry about him for the food stores because that was mayhem at the time. But in June, we retested him and internally he was still super inflamed. And I really didn't want to do medicine. But it was sort of, again, when it's an urgent matter, medicine is amazing and does amazing things. So we did go on medicine, very strong medicines. And every time he got these infusions, you know, I would hold my breath and just, you know, pray. I would literally sit at night reading medical journals. That's just what I do. Like, I think as a mom, you just you don't stop advocating for your child. And I still would always come to the doctor's appointments with questions and question the doctors and challenge the doctors in the nicest kind of way. But really come prepared and not just say, OK, here's my child. You have them and I'll do whatever you want. And maybe it's because of my background that we've already had issues with medicine for myself in the past. And I saw the damage it did to my body and led to Crohn's. I was afraid, you know, you have to look at the side effects of these medicines. And this is like a resetting of your mind. And I have to say this to my husband, look at the side effects and just assume that that might happen. Are you comfortable with that? Are you comfortable with that? And really, when you start reading the toilet paper list of things that they can get, cancers, this and that, I mean, you would probably stop in your tracks. And so I said, all right, I will do the medicine and keep on the testing. I would test his lab work. I would test his stool work. I did more testing than the doctors and the gastros even did because I wanted to know where he was. And I actually, through all this testing, realized that certain labs had different variables and sort of as a scientific experiment, the numbers would go up and down to the point that that's not normal. So, okay, maybe this isn't the best lab and let's use this lab where there's more consistency. And it's interesting as you start diving in, you have to just keep going and you have to keep advocating and you have to keep learning and studying and reading. And it was through that we're sort of in this next chapter now of my son's journey that on my own, because of the research and I feel comfortable, we have all these tools at our fingertips, the enteral nutrition, you know, God forbid he gets sick again. You know, his labs were good. His inflammation markers were good. I've taken him off the medicine since. I had read from the medical journals that after two years, you know, you start to decline in terms of like the efficacy of the medicine. So he was on it for two and a half because it took a while to do the testing and everything to get him where I was comfortable to get him off it. And we're in sort of uncharted territory. And while that's scary at one point I do feel liberated that I don't need to rely on a doctor's appointment or a doctor's office like I am taking matters into my own hands and and monitoring my child more than a doctor would and hopefully that story can empower other moms to do the same for their children and hopefully when they're even healthy like you said like don't wait till they're sick but we should be doing lab work not just once a year it should be twice a year so that if something starts to show like who knows if I was like doing it for my kid back then maybe Brandon was showing signs of them I have no idea. I, I think the word you used a couple of times in this story, also journey, it really is a journey. There is no destination. We're never going to eliminate sickness, right? Totally. I mean, that's part of life. That's part of living. But it's having, you know, the tools you need to navigate that journey as best you can, which which you're doing. Which and is I amazing. Think that um, I'd love to hear your story. I think you kind of got into the wellness space first through work and your career advocating for elderly. So I didn't think about wellness for until I was much older. I, I had an eating disorder as a teenager, but that was as eating disorders can be more about control than about wellness or health. It, wellness never even took place in the conversations and the therapy and everything I did around that as a teenager. It wasn't really a part of my life. But How long did you have the eating disorder from when to when? Probably about three years. And I then I was in 
treatment for about two years, and which was therapy, nutrition. They did talk about nutrition, but not more about how many calories you need to get through the day, not about quality. nothing to do with quality. It wasn't connected to wellness at all, the treatment really, which is interesting. I mean, it, it helps me. I'm in a much better space, obviously, as an adult than I was as a teenager, but wellness was not part of that conversation, which is interesting. And I wonder if that's changed now. I would bet that it, it has. Yeah, um, I don't know. The, yeah. Well, I would, I would hope that it has, let me say. <laughs> the nutrition that the hospitals were giving us was just sad. Uh, yeah. Well, that's a whole other story. Yeah. And then I went to law school and I ended up working with older adults and people with disability and access to healthcare issues. So I spent 15 years advocating at nonprofits, helping people navigate the healthcare system, trying to access care. Always it was for acute situations, kind of when the things were so bad, there is no easy fix. It struck me how our healthcare system, it is shocking how we really do only address situations when they become acute and how frustrating it is as a lawyer, which I loved helping people and I loved working with this population, there wasn't much I could do in terms of really solving the larger issue or the root of the problem. We were just advocating for insurance coverage for a prescription drug or a surgery, which is helpful, of course, but there's so much more that can be done. Doctors don't talk to each other, as you mentioned. There's a different doctor for every part of the body, but of course it's all connected. And our systems in this country are not good at allowing doctors the time to talk to each other because they're not compensated for that that time. For doctors who want to have those conversations, it's extraordinarily difficult because the system doesn't support it. Our system is just so flawed in so many ways. We do a disservice to our communities because people don't don't have control yeah. over it. It's a sick care system. And I think it's hard for people to swallow that pill. You know, 100%. They love swallowing pills, actually. I was going to say. <laughs> But I love swallowing it, pills. it's like a reality check of, wow, <laughs> it is a sick care system. And sadly, until you're faced with a health challenge, sometimes that's when it becomes glaringly obvious. And hopefully, you know, our goal is to help people not have to get to that point, like you said. There are certain things you can't avoid. And I mean, as we talked about, there are ups and downs, but there are things you can do to try to avoid getting to that point and to live your life to the fullest and feel well. Part of what helped me understand those choices, I had my first child, my daughter, when I was 28. And my second child, same time as Amber, I was 31. And while I was pregnant, my dear friend married my cousin and became a holistic nutritionist. And I was one of her first clients, uh, Dina Barcella, who I hope will be on the show as well, and really taught me that exactly as Amber discussed, food has power. Food can be medicine. What we choose to put in our body has an incredible impact on our health, our mental state. Really, it's everything. connected to everything. It's especially important with babies. You know, we have always recommended giving oatmeal to babies. And, and you know, by, the set, by my second child, after working with Dina, I was cutting up liver and egg yolks and really giving much more nutritious, nutritionally dense foods to my son because I had that information and I had that power. Nonetheless, there are things, even when we have that information, there are things that happen that we can't control. So when I was pregnant with my third child, I was 34 and I had had two beautiful, healthy babies at about 30, two weeks, my wonderful OBGYN said to me, you know, you've had two big babies and this time your stomach is measuring really small. It's weird. Let me send you for a scan. I don't know why your stomach stopped growing. So from the scan, they could tell that the baby was not breathing well and he was very small for his age. So they sent me directly to the hospital and at the hospital they did a week of testing telling me there's something really wrong with your baby, um, but we don't know what it is. So in my head, I'm like, what do you mean? I make healthy babies. Like I had two of them, I can show you, uh, you know. <laughs> All along my doctor would say like, listen, best case scenario, there's something structurally wrong inside and once we get him out, you know, he'll grow better outside the womb than in. So after a week of being in the hospital and testing and not being able to figure out what had happened, they decided that they had to take him out and they did a C-section at 34 weeks. And when they did the C-section, they saw that he had tied a true knot in his cord, Ooh. meaning he swam through a circle in the cord and tied a knot. So not around the neck, which is a lot, a lot of babies have that. This is a true knot in the cord and the knot was just loose enough that some food and oxygen could get through, but obviously he wasn't getting enough. And most babies who this happens to don't make it. Wow. So I was incredibly lucky, but at the same time, had a baby that was two pounds at 34 weeks, which is very, very small. You know, a number of health issues. There are a lot of babies in the NICU who are there just to put on some weight. 
we were not one of those families. We were the families that they put in the back <laughs> with the babies that need the most care uh, and the families that are the most emotional. Um, he spent several months in the hospital and it, with surgeries and blood transfusions, lots and lots of antibiotics, which I didn't love. But when your baby is in the hands of the NICU, you don't really feel like you have, you can't argue. You kind of have to submit yourself to what they think is best, which is what we did. And he got through. He was discharged from the hospital and came home. How old was he when he came home? I want to say about 13 weeks, maybe 14 weeks. But he was discharged without any oxygen support, you know, really nothing other than they had put him on reflux medication. I tried to wean him off of that as soon as I could because I reflux medication can also interfere with how the body absorbs nutrients. So and he he was still very, very small for his age. I could also tell that he wasn't breathing well um, when he would get a cold. He couldn't breathe. I mean, there were times, there were several times where I take him to the emergency room in the middle of the night because he could not get oxygen. And it took years, years, and lots of meeting with lots and lots of advocacy experts and advocates to understand because he doesn't have asthma. He doesn't have, you know, he had the tonsils and adenoids taken out. It didn't make a difference. It really took a lot of investigation and time to the point where I did quit my job because this needed my, you know, he needed my attention coming home and the doctor's visits were were numerous, but he has sleep apnea. It's connected to his muscle weakness and his narrow passageway. And the muscle weakness is because he didn't have the nutrients he needed in the womb. There's no easy fix. Airway has become a huge passion of mine and it's connected to so many, just like food, it's fundamental, right? If you're not getting enough oxygen, your brain doesn't function well, your whole body shuts down if you're not getting enough sleep or oxygen. And so that's something I hope that we get to talk about on the yes. show as well, because you taught me so much about breath. And I think we probably started talking about it when I was starting to study breath work and the power of breath. And it's so simple, right? You just yeah. think, oh, we breathe every day. Over the years, our passageways have narrowed and granted your son was born with more right, narrow passageways, but all the alternative things, and we'll definitely do an episode on it that you did to help open up his airways in a natural way, even from a palate expander, which is, you know, when we were kids, no one had palate expanders. <laughs> now yeah. everyone does. Everybody, and yeah. <laughs> it's really linked to breath and it's so vital for life, like you said. It's so important. And just to be clear, I mean, I am hugely, hugely grateful to the doctors and the hospital. I think both of us would have died you know, I mean, like, just like, I'm so grateful that he's here. It's a wonderful example of how what we're going to be talking about can work hand in hand with modern medicine, right? I mean, modern medicine. It's a partnership. Him. I think it's more it should be a partnership, not just a one way road. Maybe exactly. that's the difference. Exactly. And, and I found that for him, uh, really using both uh, one to support the other is what we need to do because there is no one shot solution. He's doing really well. He's eight years old now in second grade. And again, it's a journey. We're still always working on it. There's no easy solution, but I'm so fortunate that I, I get to work on it with him. What was it that the doctor just said to you the other week that they were marveled at in terms of his progress? Because <laughs> I thought that was so beautiful to hear. Oh, I, I, I'm going to sound like I'm bragging, but I'll now you, you should brag. <laughs> <laughs> we did a, a neuropsych for him because he has some memory issues and which are probably linked to the sleep apnea, to the lack of oxygen. But the doctor uh, who did the neuropsych said she had never seen a, ba some, a child who had his birth history rebound as strongly as he did, that he's so functional. It is amazing. His body was in such distress, but the brain was pretty protected. Given his traumatic birth, he is an extremely functional child. Um, and I'm so, so grateful for that. And I do really believe that that's in part because he was able to have a mix of modern medicine and alternative therapies to support him as well. Um, How would you say from this experience, you know, you had to, you know, he's eight years old now, what are the therapies that you really delved into that were more alternative? I don't even know if you would consider alternative because that one of the main things that really helped him was orthodontic work. And but you started, did an alternative version of that. Kind we of. did. Yes. Yes. No. I mean, when you when you're when you're running around New York City looking for an orthodontist for your two year old, everybody thinks you're crazy. I'll <laughs> tell you that, <laughs> which is what I was doing. But I knew I knew that this is how do you know uh, we took his tonsils and adenoids out and we did a sleep study before and after and the sleep apnea number was exactly the same. So you knew he had sleep apnea before he was two years old. Yes. We Got did it. a sleep study at about one uh, before maybe even before one year old. And then 
usually for many people, taking tonsils and adenoids out will resolve that. For him, it made zero difference. Mm. And they wanted to do another second surgery that was further down. It was so serendipitous. I happened to be in Philadelphia where I grew up. And my dear friend is a dental hygienist. And she said to me, have you spoken to an orthodontist? Because there are people who specialize, orthodontists who specialize in airway for young children. And that can often be connected. And I could hear the trouble breathing in here. I mean, it wasn't coming from here. You could hear it in here. Right. I couldn't find anybody in New York City at the time. That's changed. Now there's a lot of people who do airway work. But at the time, it was incredibly difficult. And people thought I was crazy because nobody works with children that young. But that's part of it. I mean, we've also done acupuncture, chiropractic work, nutrition. He's currently seeing an Ayurvedic doctor. You really there's many pieces. Right. We've really delved in. And I, I feel very, very blessed that we can do that. And that's also a huge motivation to bring experts in and interview them and share that information. Because again, you know, I worked for years with people that can't afford to pay for that information. And so at least knowing what you can do at home and at least knowing what's available, I think is a first step to helping make that information more widely available. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, with this podcast, The Well Drop, we really want to give you drops of everyday information, sort of the cliff notes on wellness. You know, we've lived it. We've done the work. We've done the research. And I think there's nothing greater than mothers. You don't know until you become a mom about like how protective you'll become of your children and your family. And, you know, you really bring out that mama bear in you. You do anything for them. You would do anything yeah. for them. And sometimes at the sacrifice for you, but really at the end of the day, I think Dina and I sort of learned at the same time, because Dina and I were friends by then, like you really also have to put yourself first and that that is such a powerful message. And I think in the wellness space, through all the research I've done, there's not that many female voices out there. And I've really learned and I hope to advocate for women and we really want to interview as many female experts as possible to show that like the female body is just different. And many clinical studies, unbeknownst to me until now, were done really on male um, male bodies. So even anything from like fitness to food, it's not based on our demographic. And that's a big difference. We're differently hormonally. Our makeup is so different. And I think that we really want to dive into that and help share what, you know, we are learning on our own with you we guys. Yeah, we need to connect back to our moon cycles. Yes, yeah, cycle. I mean, <laughs> Dean and I are all about seed the cycling. Since, and it's more <laughs> things I look at it from, yes, it's for us and we want to share amongst, you know, adults, but really also to then teach our children. We both have daughters and I want my daughter to be synced with the moon cycle. We weren't taught these things as a kid and seed cycling and that can help with cramps and moodiness and really kind of keep you at a cruising altitude. And, you know, unless you're educated or tap into that knowledge, I think it could really like set you free for, you know, years to come. You know, some people have really harsh cramps when it's their cycle time. I luckily hadn't, but I'm even learning that now that we're entering this perimenopause state of like the importance of that because your body's always changing. It's kind of like, how do you just like stay in the rhythm? But you got to connect to that rhythm in the first place. Totally. And it's amazing how connected that is to mental health as well. I am fascinated by the connection, the cyclical connection between our mental health and our physical health and how one feeds the other. I'm a huge believer in that holding on to pain and grief affects you physically. The bacteria in your gut affects you mentally. Um, yeah, and your and muscles in, hold emotions too. Back and forth. I really hope and I expect that that's something we'll be able to talk about on this podcast as well. A lot of the experts who we've spoken to over the years about that because they really do feed each other. Food is connected to that as well. You know, there are yeah. different foods that can help with anxiety or create more anxiety. And so it's it's really fascinating how it all works together and how everything is is connected. It is. And I think, you know, there's so much to say about, you know, the snacks that we eat. We've become this packaged society. You know, when we were kids, it was all about the canned soup. Now it's all about packaged goods and sort of going back to the basics. And I think really just simplifying and less is more. And like, what are those core things? And if you can get as natural as possible, I think that will help people start coming out of the fog that we've all sort of been in. I think where everyone's used to sort of living in this haze and it is overwhelming and we sort of want to make it feel sift through the noise that you can do it and that, you know, don't a lot of my friends say, ah, oh, just 
it's a lost cause, whatever, it doesn't matter. So if you're not even doing it for yourself, I'm sure you definitely want to do it for your kids. And I think that's a big difference of like, do it for your family because you're going to be the one that has to clean up their mess anyway. So you <laughs> might as well start doing the work. And, and just to be clear, my kids love pretzels, right? Like, I mean, it's yes. hard to It's avoid all about stuff. balance too. It's all about balance and you don't have to do it all. You can do what you can do. The you know, 80 20 rule. You know, yeah. there's no such thing as perfectionism. And I yeah. think you can live in that sort of 80 20 phase when you are being so good most of the time. So you can enjoy yourself the other 20 percent. I think we're kind of now living in the reverse of enjoy 80 percent, be good only 20 percent. We kind of got to just flip the ratio. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's that's the goal. But it's it's a journey. It's, it's a journey. <laughs> and we hope that you're going to jump on that ride with us and join us for the podcast and tune in to wherever you listen to your podcast and share with a friend who may need it. You know, Whatever episode resonates with you, please share with friends and family. And our goal is really just to help people. We help one person, we achieve our mission. And we will be asking our experts who come on this show to offer concrete takeaways that you can do at home so that you can walk away from each 30 minute episode with something that will actually improve your life. Um, so it's information, but also concrete things that you can incorporate as best you see fit. So listen while you're driving the car, walking to that meeting, going to pick up your kids, or if you're even at the park, tune in for quick tips on how to feel your best and live your best life. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Well Drop, Own Your Wellness. Please subscribe to The Well Drop on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Share with a friend who we can help too. Follow us on social media at The Well Drop.